Do you want a wealthy retirement without worrying about money? Welcome to Retire in Texas, where you will discover how to enjoy your faith, your family, and your freedom in the state of Texas. And now, here's your host, financial advisor, author, and all-around good Texan, Daryl Lyons. Hey, this is Daryl Lyons, CEO and co-founder of PAX Financial Group, and you're listening to Retire in Texas. Thanks for tuning in. I got to tell you the disclosure, this information is intended to be not specific to your needs of investment advice or tax advice or legal advice. And so we encourage you to visit paxfinancialgroup.com for all the legal disclosures. And also want to encourage you to text the number 74868. If you need to speak to one of our advisors, it'll be 15 minutes. It'll be a consultation. It won't cost you anything, but you just need to text Texas to 74868. All right. So I've got Brad Hobbs here today. I'm excited to have Brad. You're going to hear a little bit more about his story and his background and expertise. And actually we're going to get into some little personality profiles. Is that cool? Yeah, a little bit there. Okay, good. So Brad, before we jump into the personality profile stuff, which I nerd out on a lot, we won't nerd out with our audience. We'll right, keep it very right. high level. But um, before we get to that, you're originally from Georgia, right? Is that right? I grew up in South Georgia. Okay. Small in South Georgia, anything below Atlanta is, is South Georgia. Okay. Yeah. And so small rural town, call that home. Like I love Georgia, but I've never been to all of Georgia. Is it a pretty part or what is it like there? I mean, yeah, what's, what's, it's, the, what's you know, the in topography? North Georgia's pretty, got some yeah. mountains, tall trees. Yeah. In Georgia, they have the unofficial, what they call the Nat line. Uh-huh. And so it's this line that runs through the state. Everybody above the Nat line. Uh, gets to enjoy all the beauty, sometimes four seasons. Everybody below the gnat line has to fight these little bugs that come around that are called gnats. And so yeah. there's literally a split in the state. And so if you're from Georgia, you kind of, are you below the gnat line oh, or okay. all above right. the gnat line? Everyone knows this. Everybody kind of knows. If yeah. you're from Georgia, because you can't go outside without fighting the gnats if you're below. So I I grew up below the gnat line yeah. and uh, had to figure out all the tricks growing up in sports and stuff of how do you keep gnats from inside your helmet and underneath your hat and all that kind of stuff because it's sort of like the plague and uh, we all have those things. They're but so annoying. Oh my gosh. It's like when I get to heaven, I probably want to ask about gnats first. I'll ask yeah. about mosquitoes. That'll yeah, be my go. first question. Yeah. The benefit of gnats are just annoying. They don't yeah. really bite, yeah. but you know, mosquitoes, Yeah, I'm pretty sure they were not a part of creation before Genesis 3. And then like there's a great fall and mosquitoes came out of that. It's the one little scripture that was left out. Yeah, (laughs) I'm sure that would theologically line up. But in my head, I'm just thinking, surely God didn't create these things to do this. Exactly. (laughs) And then we're going to get to heaven with flat foreheads and and God's going to tell us why he has it. We're like, oh, Oh, that's why you did it. (laughs) Because the whole ecosystem would have fallen apart, Daryl, of course. Right, right. (laughs) We'll learn that later. Yes, we will. We will. So how'd you get to Texas? Yeah. So about about four years ago, I was working uh, for a cool foundation in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we were doing a lot of work overseas, economic development, pastor development in East Africa, West Africa. And a good friend of mine was a pastor in town. And they had just basically said, hey, we want to do some things that are very unique in the mission world of church planting, local community engagement, international engagement. Uh, Would you come build out an organization to do that? And uh, Daryl, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it was not the most intriguing idea at first, and, and we turned it down for several months. When you say we? My wife and I. Okay. Big move for us. We were really enjoying what we were doing in Charlotte and felt just that was home. We actually just bought our dream house. So we were living okay. on a cul-de-sac, big Carolina mansion. We moved in it for three months. Mm. And uh, uh, January 6, 2019, that date has a different meaning now. But my wife and I were reading in Genesis chapter 12. And in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham to leave his family mm. and go to a land that he's never been to before. And he doesn't know where, where he's actually headed. And so we met each other in our living room. And it was like, we have to pick up and move to San Antonio. So we moved to San Antonio uh, wow. right about four years ago. Wow. So financially, that's another conversation. <laughs> but, you know, just the idea behind saying, okay, kids, I know you've got friends here. Wow. We're out. How did the kids handle it? You know, so my kids were young at the time we made that decision. And for them, we had always kind of baked into our family that we build deep friendships and deep-rooted lives. We live open-handedly. And so if God picks up 
and tells us to move, then we're going to pick up a move and it's going to be a great adventure. We don't know what's on the other side of it, but it's going to be a great adventure. Is that how you were raised? Did your mom and dad raise you that way? You know, there are a lot of things I look back in my life that they just kind of sewed into us very yeah. open-handedly. Didn't have a lot growing up of, of everything, but they taught us to love Jesus and to trust Jesus more than common sense sometimes. Were they pastors or? They were not. My parents were really first, I call them first generation Christians uh-huh. that came from broken homes. Uh, had some religious influences from their grandparents, but not necessarily so much from their parents. Okay. They came to follow Jesus in college, got married, and basically said, we're not going to repeat the mistakes of our parents. Yeah. And uh, they drug my brother and I to church every chance they could get. They were drug dealers. They were. They yeah. were. So they drug us there. But one of the things, I, the two things I remember growing up is my dad would wake up early in the morning. I want to say early, about 4.30 in the morning. And when I would come downstairs, he was always on his knees praying for our family. Mm. And so that's the spiritual legacy he began to build. And then on the flip side of it, uh, we didn't play sports if there was a church activity going on. So my family would get, my parents would get me a game ball for every game I missed because of a church activity. So they get a game ball. So I've got, you know, a dozen baseballs or so around my parents' house of like, the, you know, this day, this time. And I always knew because my mom had really nice handwriting. It was not a coach's handwriting. But the game balls that we, they were taking a stand. We were going to miss church. Uh, we were not going to miss church for a sporting event. So that's a little bit of the, the background that that's, I grew up in. That's fascinating. And I, I mean, what a legacy. It is. Gosh. So do you find yourself adopting elements of what they taught you? You know, I, I think it's really hard for us to get away from the way that our parents raise us, good or bad. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I definitely see some things where it's like, man, I said I would never do that. And I'm, I'm doing that. But yeah. I also see a lot of good things that my parents were intentional about yeah. um, that we're trying to pass on to our kids. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. So, you know, when I, I'm in the money business, so I always tell people that, you know, inheritance is what you leave to someone, but a legacy is what you leave in someone. Oh, that's a great word. And to know that they left that legacy and that's going to be passed down from multiple generations. And then I, I deal with people with lots of money and, you know, some not, but when I'm talking to business owners and they're struggling to leave the business to the kids, like it's almost the odds of leaving it successfully to the kids is very low. And the third or fourth generation, forget about it. So I say all that because that what your parents did, I mean, and they're still alive, right? So they, they may have not left you a lot of money or may not leave you a business, but they left you that. Correct. That's amazing. Which will, you know, far outlive if they had left me a financial inheritance. Because that's shaping my kids and Lord willing will shape my grandkids one day. Yeah, that you should be proud for that. So you get to San Antonio and giving God the credit for nudging you. And I give you the credit for listening, right? And I always, I always talk about like our responsibility as Christians is to respond to his ability, right? And so I give you credit and your wife credit for responding to that. And then, of course, your parents for instilling that in you. But you made it to San Antonio. Did you decide to join San Antonio community in the summer? Or was it, you know, what was your timing yeah, like there? Because you uh, might have just drove, and, uh, drove right so back. I, I, had, I had done some work in San Antonio in the past, which uh-huh. is why I was kind of so hesitant to move here. Yeah. Because the best part of San Antonio is its people, not its weather or its uh, geography. Yeah. And so it took us a little bit to survive the summer heat. Yeah. And... Uh, but then it just came, we tell ourselves it's like living in North Dakota in the winter. I'm not sure really how bad it is to live in North Dakota in the winter, but uh, I, living in San Antonio in the summer feels about the same. It's just hot. Yeah. It's just miserable. You gear up for it, you survive it. And uh, we're very grateful that the temperatures are slowly starting to drop below 100 degrees now. Exactly. With a cloud and a breeze and under 100 degrees, it feels like it's fall. So pastor calls you up. How did a pastor in San Antonio find you? Yeah. So my very first job was uh, running leadership development conferences and programs around the country and across the globe. Okay. And so we had connected while I was doing that. Okay. So I actually got to travel together a good bit. And so we had uh, lots of shared meals and, and hotel rooms and waffle houses across right. the country. Are you, can you tell us who that pastor is? Yeah, it's uh, Pastor Ed Newton at Community Bible Church. Yeah, okay. And so he knew you, he had broken bread with you, hung out with you and said, hey, I've got a vision of doing more. I mean, the yeah. church is already doing it a lot. And he had a vision. He just hadn't found the person to really execute this vision. And so he called you up. Is that right? That's pretty much the short version of the story. Yeah. So are you employed by Community Bible Church? Yeah, well, you know, you talk about here's the, here's the great way that God works. We got here and COVID hits. My job went from creating something new to really how do we respond as a church 
to the COVID crisis in our community. Yeah. And so really had the opportunity to work alongside him and crafting, how do we love a community that's going through something that obviously the, the world had never experienced before, you know, in the, in the present time. Sure. And so once we got through that, the Lord began to stir in our heart, just some different opportunities to see how the kingdom of God was moving, not just in the church from a church building standpoint, but also through kingdom businesses and then nonprofit and church work all working collaboratively together. So we stepped out about a year ago and have really been working in that space, helping business leaders and kingdom minded leaders execute what they believe is God's vision for whatever their entity or company is. So well, here's what's kind of cool. Like, you know, it's kind of one of those Romans 8, 28 yeah. things, right? I mean, COVID shook up the church it did, and it probably needed a good shake in. Agreed. And here we have, Ed's an incredible guy, a gifted guy, but just like any other leader, we have a lot of ideas. Like ideas, like I had an idea two minutes ago and before that it was five minutes ago. And then you execute and then all of a sudden pandemics hit and you're like, yeah. okay, that was a great idea. But now here's the resources I have. What do I do and where are the needs? And so God kind of like eh, reorganized that. And so now I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you started collaborating with businesses and nonprofits and churches and saying, how do we serve? Is that right? You hit it right on the nail on the head there. And serving is ambiguous. So Correct. you're trying to respond to needs. You're not saying this is what we're going to do. Are you just kind of taking inventory of what the needs are? Is that what you were doing for a while? So it's, it's a both and, and what I'd say a both and is I, I believe God gives us passions uh -huh. and competencies for the burdens or the, the heartache of the city and in the time at which we live. So a lot of what we do is we sit with leaders and say, what really has God put on your heart? That's a burden. Let's fine tune that because if it's not birthed out of your heart, it's another program. It's another activity. We can throw some money at it. But what we want to do is help every leader fulfill the reason that God's put them on this earth. And a lot of times what that looks like is we find what God's put as a passion, as a burden. And then we go, okay, these are all the resources that God's given you to execute that. Mm -hmm. Let's match it up with where it can make its greatest kingdom contribution in the city. So some of that requires a little self-reflection as a business owner and a leader of a nonprofit. And therein lies your ability to take your leadership skills that you kind of were trained up on early right. in your life. And that the low hanging fruit there is saying, I think I can help you understand who you are as a person and use some personality profiles to do that. Is that right? We do. And, and I'll be honest with you, the, the hang up that we find, whether it's in the church, the business sector, the nonprofit sector is really helping leaders identify who God's made them to be and living out that identity in the workplace. So, you know, for those that don't know, I'm actually writing my fourth book and I spent some time working on that this weekend. And one of the cool things about writing is you just get to crystallize your thought. And what I recognize is how understated it is for somebody to transition from their occupation into retirement and not having gone through that cerebral, emotional and spiritual exercise of saying who who did God make me to be? What's my purpose here? And when people jump from I'm working and my identity has been my occupation to I'm retired, what I was reading is that heart attacks go up 40%. And, and it's not because there was the environment changed. It's because all of a sudden you don't know your purpose anymore. And so you have some tools that you've been able to use to get in front of that before people retire. Yeah, right. right. And so tell me about some of those tools and maybe actually more importantly, tell me about how people can use different various personality profiles to understand who they are. Yeah. So let's unpack identity a little bit, because I think our identity of who God's made us to be is really a combination of three pieces. One okay. would be that the personality traits or profiles that there's like introvert, of, extro extrovert, introvert, extrovert, Myers-Briggs, your yeah. DS personality, Enneagram. Yeah. Those are ways that we start to discover who God made us to be sure. wired us. So our internal wiring. The second thing is really our past. So uh, we talked about my parents earlier, like yeah. my parents have actually shaped, God used my parents to shape who he wanted me to be. And so our past, we actually have to like dig through that to figure out identity. And then the, the third thing we would look at is just what are the natural skill sets, the competencies or the resources that, that God's put at our disposal. And so you're highly gifted. And we could spend this podcast talking about what you're gifted in, but really taking your history, your personality and your gifts and finding the webbing between those three make up our identity. And uh, when we talk about those pieces, what we're looking at is matching our identity to our heart. And our heart, as you've probably read, is it really is always asking three questions. Why do I belong and matter? What makes me safe and secure? And why am I here? Mm. 
And so if we answer those three questions with a proper rooted identity, then we actually get to live at our highest and best. Mm. So oftentimes you mentioned a retiree. So those inflection points, when we change career, we change jobs, we change cities. A lot of times we've answered the three questions that our heart asks, you know, why do I belong here? Why am I safe and secure? What am I supposed to do? We've answered that through our vocation or through a people. And when that's ripped away, our heart's left asking, well, wait, why am I here? Mm. I even see this, you know, I, I see with this with the most loving moms who become in empty nesters. 100%. I see this with executives that got the gold watch and then the next day business is still running, but they're not taking calls anymore. Like this is not just a minor point. And so you're getting in front of that, obviously. Well, and we're trying to get in front of it because I, I think the next wave of really the results of, of our pandemic, our global pandemic, as we we're talking about, is the fallout of kingdom minded faith leaders who are wrestling, trying to answer their heart's questions. Mm. And if they fall away or they're no longer leading with the same courage, then our cities and our communities actually pay a great price for that. And so if you were to, uh, to be half the leader that you were for Jesus in the future that you are now, well, the community actually suffers from that. So what we're trying to do is help leaders go, let's make sure you lead for the long haul and that you leave a wake and a legacy behind you. So I'm um, finding that comfort is one of the enemies here that tends to take us away from digesting this thing. Because look, why do I need to, to dig into this when I'm pretty comfortable right now? Right. Like my kids are good, you know, they're kind of messed up or whatever. And, and, and I've got a good job. I've got money in the bank. I check all the boxes. I'm comfortable. I'm playing golf. Like why even mess with this right now? So what would you say to somebody like that? I think the question becomes what type of fruit are we trying to leave in our legacy? And uh, there's the fruit of comfortability where everything is good, but it's not necessarily great. And the first piece I'd say is, hey, let's not settle for uh, goodness when God designed us to experience his greatness. The second piece of that is uh, we're always one day away from the next crisis. And crisis, it can happen from a phone call from a doctor. Mm -hmm. It can happen from you not seeing something in the markets or whatever it is, however it hits us, that crisis tends to shake our identity at its core. And if it's not a solid, we haven't worked through the pieces of saying, this is really who I am, and this is how I answer my heart's questions, then that really rocks and shakes our world in a way that can sometimes be debilitating to our future. So going back to what you do every day, yeah. are you still working closely with Community Bible and, or is it a separate entity now or is it locked so, arms? How does that look? Yeah. So it's a separate entity now, but work to cheer Community Bible Church on in every way possible we can in the city. Yeah. Okay. So that's still a good rapport. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'd be surprised how many people are listening to this and they're like, I know Ed Newton. It, one, he's one of the, the greatest communicators, but just one of the greatest guys you'll meet. And a good dresser. Yeah. I, I'm going to throw that out there because it just makes me look really bad yeah. with the way that I dress next to him. Yeah. His Nike collection is next level. Yeah. That's awesome. So I say all that because now it's an independent organization that you're responsible for still driving this mission and vision that God put on you and your wife's heart. Is that right? Has, That's has anything changed or has it just been more refined? I think, so last September, there was a, a massive shift where the Lord really just kind of led us apart to separate the entity and what he'd put on our heart from Community Bible. But really it's been a refinement process outside of that one major shift when we got here of really why he designed us and wired us and how do those, her identity and calling really how is it complementary to mine and how is mine complementary to hers? Mm. And so that we both get to live out what God made us, made us to be and to do. Wow. So there's so many more things to ask, but I need to get into some of the nuts and bolts real quick. What's the name of the business now? Uh, the name of the business is called Luminary Global. Yeah. And uh, the name Luminary was really taken from the idea of like lights that shine in the darkness. Yeah. And so what we're really working is to make sure there are leaders and companies that are shining in the midst of a complex, broken world. For Jesus. And who hires you, the business or the, the So leader? both hands. So leaders and businesses both okay. hire us. Typically, if a business hires us, there's a problem that they're trying to diagnose or they're trying to grow. And, yeah. And the reality is, is it's always tied back to the leader. Like I've just, I've yet to come to a place where the leader's identity is not one of the contributing factors to the growth. Everything rises and falls on leadership. And, and I've said that for years and, and it sounds like a cliche, but- it's a truth. It's a truth. Yeah. The leader may come in and say, look, I've got organizational issues. And you're like, oh, okay, I hear you, but I really know it's you. And now I've got to find a way to get to you. 
So you're working with business leaders in the city, predominantly the city of San Antonio, or is it so, Texas? So we have some businesses in Texas. Sure. And then we have some organizations that work nationally and internationally that we're working with. Okay. What you're going to do is, you know, they're going to come to you with a problem, right? Right. And so then you're going to try to find the very heart of the problem, which is very much, gosh, this, this goes really deep, but it's transformative. You're going to find the identity of the leaders of the organization. And then once they truly own their identity, then we're talking about right seat stuff, right? That's it. And so, so much of a leader, when there's a problem, there's a lot of activity going on. And what we're trying to do is go, okay, why are we doing those activities and why are we getting this result? Yeah. And if we can unpack really, uh, so earlier I mentioned why we have to get to the heart of the leader is because if, if something doesn't flow from the heart, it's really going to be difficult to change the culture of the organization long-term. We can go for some quick wins, but really changing the organization, we have to identify what is in the heart of the leader and be able to work from that space. You know, this is a countrywide issue though. It's countrywide. Yeah, this is really, really good stuff. And for those that are listening, you may want to listen to this again, because there's some things that Brad had mentioned that is just really, really impactful. And he's bringing, I think, from what I've, and I do leadership stuff all the time, but what you're bringing is gold. So thank you. I appreciate that. So suppose somebody wants to hire you individually. Can you, they hire you individually? They can. Okay. This morning spent time with individual leaders. Okay. And uh, actually a couple of retirees who are trying to figure out, okay, I'm here, but I'm kind of played enough golf and I've ridden the boat enough. Like what's next? It is really, really important for somebody to connect with you. I mean, I've seen it over and over and over and over again. So I'm glad that you're a resource. Do they go to your website? Yeah, the best way to do that is luminaryglobal.org. Okay. And uh, they can contact me there and we'll, we'll figure out a time to sit down together. Yeah. And also if you want to text 74868 and you put in Texas and you said, hey, I want to talk to that leadership guy, we'll connect you. So That'd we can do it that I way too. That. Some people are driving and don't drive in text, but you know, yeah. it's easier to remember 74868. That is. It's yeah. a great resource that you've developed. Yeah. Thank you. So we've covered a lot of ground. I had a list of questions here. I don't know which ones I hit, which ones I missed, but uh, the most important question I never forget, and that's, um, what's your favorite salsa? Oh, that's a great question. So my wife makes a good homemade salsa, uh-huh. but in our family, we're queso people. And so we okay. have a queso rating score and uh, we're big fans of, of Blanco queso or like white queso. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if, if it's a yellow queso, it, it automatically gets deducted three or four points. No kidding. So, okay. All it's, right. It's personal bias, but you know, if you've got a good white queso with some sauces in there and some add-ons, typically some guacamole thrown in there and some peppers, like you're going to get way up there in our rating score. This is really good insight from That's, a guy from Georgia. Hey, just, you, you know, acclimated quickly. We tried, we yeah. tried hard. So yeah. we're big fans of tacos and lots of queso, Yeah, which is not good for your waistline, but really good for San Antonio. <laughs> exactly. You're in. <laughs> I'm in. So thank you so much, Brad. This has been a pleasure and a blessing. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. Hey, thanks for listening to Retire in Texas. And I um, want to remind everyone to visit PaxFinancialGroup.com or text Texas to 74868. And of course, I want to remind everyone listening that you think different when you think long-term. Have a great day. This is the podcastfactory.com.